I don't know if you thought about it much before, but I present to you in the notes the fact that in his last week of earthly ministry, prior to his giving his life on the cross of Calvary, Christ had a, quite a lot to say to the disciples. In fact, there are, as I've listed for you, 20 chapters, either in part or in toto, that were a part of this instruction. Now, between Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you have quite a bit of overlap. They cover a lot of the same events, maybe a little bit more exhaustive, maybe a little bit more briefly. But John has very unique information. He's the only one who chronicles for us what happened in the upper room as the disciples are meeting with Jesus. The other gospel writers are pretty much telling you on a day-by-day basis what is going on. But John focuses in on the night before Jesus' betrayal and then his crucifixion in what he gives to us, particularly in chapters 13 through 17. So I wanted to go to one of the themes that Jesus brings up in those passages and in the upper room discourse, and that is what I've called the other comforter taken from John chapter 14, where Jesus is speaking of the Holy Spirit, who is going to be sent to have a very unique ministry in a believer's life from this point onward. So we're going to look at these three sections of three chapters, not uh, many verses, but we're going to look at what God has for us regarding the coming of the Holy Spirit in this new ministry. So in verse 16, John chapter 14, verse 16, we read this, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper or another comforter to be with you forever. Now, this word helper or comforter comes from the Greek word parakletos. Paraclete is the anglicized version of that. And you may well have heard of someone saying it means called alongside to help. The idea uh, is involved in the etymology of the word. But what it means, we can describe in several headings. And so I wanted to give you those ideas. The first of all, it can be used as an advocate. This same word is used of Jesus Christ. He is our advocate with the Father. It is the same word, parakletos. So here, the Holy Spirit is described as having this role, just as Jesus Christ does. As our advocate before the Father, what this talks about is His pleading our cause, as we'll look at in just a few moments. But He is, first of all, the official representative of God in us. He is God indwelling us. I know frequently it is expressed uh, by children or adults about Jesus living in my heart. That's not particularly a phrase you'll find in Scripture. You do find the Holy Spirit living within us. And He is the Spirit, of course, of Christ, so there is an understanding there. But He is the pleader of our cause. Not as if there is a disagreement between the the members of the Trinity, but more as representing us as the children of God before the throne of God. Romans chapter 8 describes the Holy Spirit's role of interpreting prayers before the Father. That's the passage that talks about the groanings which cannot be uttered, the inexpressible groanings of the heart. And I believe that what that passage is saying is even when we do not have words adequate to express the desire of our heart before God, the need of our heart before God, the Holy Spirit, knowing our heart and being God, can take that and make it into a request that can be presented for our benefit before God. Think about that. The interpreter of our prayers. Have you ever gotten to that point where you just just don't even know how to pray? There are a lot of reasons why we get to that point. Some is just personal frustration. You feel like you've confessed the same sin hundreds of times, and surely God's getting tired of it. The Holy Spirit can turn that around to be a prayer request that will actually be to our benefit in glory and in our personal lives. But the Holy Spirit in this role of helper or comforter, just as Jesus Christ, is our aid, 
our helper in any kind of distress, when we're under temptation, we can plead for God's help through the intervention of the Holy Spirit who indwells us. When we're having difficulty, maybe with someone that we're just really having a trouble relating to, it's someone we're having trouble witnessing to or getting along with as a brother or sister in Christ. There are a lot of different times where we could have difficulty and the Spirit can work in us and through the Word of God to help us in those situations. A lack of knowledge. When we have a lack of wisdom, Scripture talks about us going to God, going through the intervention of the Holy Spirit. So, He is our helper. He is our comforter. But in that phrase, another comforter, there's another aspect that I would like to emphasize, and that is the word another. And what it teaches us is that the Holy Spirit is of the same character as Jesus Christ. The word in the Greek is alas. There is another word that means another of a different kind, and that's what you find in Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, where Paul speaks of another gospel, which is not another of the same kind, is not a gospel which can save, but is a quote-unquote gospel, is the way we would probably say it. Well, here it's another of exactly the same kind that we're dealing with. So Jesus is telling His disciples, in essence, just as I have been with you these three, three and a half years, and you've learned, and you feel, and you know that I am helping you spiritually, so the Holy Spirit will step into that exact same role with the same character. There's something implied here that I want to bring up at this point. If He is a comforter of the same kind, think of Jesus and then realize this, that the Holy Spirit is just as much a person as Jesus is. Just as the disciples enjoyed the physical ministry of Jesus Christ to them, we don't have that benefit. But he was saying to them, his presence with you is going to be just as real as my presence with you. Now, when we're talking about theology and the personhood of the Holy Spirit, I felt it's important to take a little bit of a detour here. How many of you have ever talked with a Jehovah's Witness on the idea of the Holy Spirit or the Trinity in general, whether in person, online, whatever? No? I see my wife raising her hand, not not, not many people. What the Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you is that there is no Trinity, that that was invented by the Catholic Church, that there only is God and it's God the Father, and Jesus would have been praying to Himself if He were God, therefore Jesus couldn't be God, and the Holy Spirit doesn't even have a name, so therefore He can't be God. But the Word of God says something completely different. The Spirit's name is immaterial. He is described as a person. What do we mean by a person? Well, a person is described, or personhood is described as, first of all, a being which has intellect. By intellect, we're referring to the ability to express him or herself. In the case of the Spirit, Scripture always uses masculine pronouns, so we'll do the same. The ability to express himself in words. The ability to lead, to give you the idea of what He wants in your life. Romans 8 verse 14 is a verse that I put in your notes there, a reference I should say. It just talks about being led. If we are led by the Spirit of Christ, then we belong to Him. If we're not, then we don't. So the Spirit, also we could look through Scripture and we would find that Scripture says things like the Spirit speaks clearly in this way and that. And the Holy Spirit directed the Apostle Paul and Peter and so on and so forth. So this idea of intellect, having mind, being able to express himself is very clearly stated regarding the Holy Spirit. A second component, which is said to be essential for personhood, is emotion. Does the Holy Spirit have emotions? Well, we're told in Scripture, for instance, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, that we're not supposed to grieve the Holy Spirit. And often the way we illustrate that concept is in the, in the relationship uh, between friends. What happens when you grieve a friend? 
it refers to the idea that you have offended that friend in some way so that it interrupts the communication that you have between you. The same is true of the Holy Spirit. He feels the interruption. Scripture also talks about quenching the Holy Spirit. Again, an emotional response, a reaction that mere power cannot have. You can't quench a power. You can't grieve an influence. His personhood is implied in what is described regarding his reaction to things. We could also look at things like anger and love and so on and so forth. We could find many scripture references. It's not my point to detour that deeply, just to suggest, and you can begin to look through scripture and see this as it's described of the Holy Spirit. The third component of personhood is will. Will, as in a sense of purpose. And one of the key passages in this regard is Acts chapter 5, where Ananias and Sapphira are struck dead because they lied to the Spirit. The idea of lying to the Spirit is the idea that the Spirit had a particular will, had a particular purpose in this matter. And when Ananias and Sapphira contrived to lie, they were lying to the Holy Spirit. That's not a wise move, right? If the Holy Spirit were a mere influence or a power, you couldn't lie to Him. wouldn't make any sense any more than lying to the wall would make any sense. But because He does have this characteristic of personhood, intellect, emotion, will, we understand that the Spirit of God, though immaterial, God the Father Himself is immaterial as well, does not have a body as we do. In fact, Jesus Christ is the only one of the Trinity that since the incarnation has a physical body. I put air quotes there because it is a spiritualized physical body at this point, but he still retains that body. I say spiritualized just simply because his body is far different from ours right now. Um, Doesn't depend on air, oxygen, the way we do. Uh, is not susceptible to injury or to sickness or aging, uh, yet it is a physical presence, a physical body in the sense that a glorified body that we will have one day will be. But getting back to the matter of him being of the same character as Jesus Christ, the text also says that he would come in response to Christ's petition or request that the Father send the Holy Spirit. So again, this character of Christ, as Christ was sent from the Father, now Christ is also sending the Spirit through, or the Father is sending Him through the agency of the Son. There is another component here of revelation as to who the Holy Spirit is in verse 17, where we read this of the other comforter, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. Now, the next several points are going to come from this verse, and it will be distinguished by what is highlighted on the screen. In this case, we're talking about the fact that He is the Spirit of truth. Think about that. Think about His relationship to truth. Scripture makes it clear that the Spirit gives us a fuller understanding of truth. For instance, another verse that deals with this is John 16, verse 13, which says, When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth, for He will not speak of His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will guide you into all truth. Think about how that was accomplished as first of all, the apostles have brought to their minds, and we'll look at this in another context here in a few moments, the truths that Jesus Christ taught or the relationship of these truths to what the Old Testament already taught, and also the additional revelation that they will be given on the basis of what was given to them already, so a fuller understanding of truth. But there is an application for us today as well. When we read the Word of God, 
we ought to be very much aware that this book contains in it truths that we miss. They're there, but we don't really comprehend them. How many times have we looked at Scripture and said, I've read that I don't know how many dozen times in my life, and all of a sudden it begins to make sense? The work of the Holy Spirit. Now, we always have to be careful that when we have these new inklings of what the, what the Word of God means, that we're not just reading something in for our own convenience. There are people that do that. We'll talk about that in, in a little bit as well. Because the Holy Spirit, because He is the Spirit of truth, remember this, He cannot lead us into error. He cannot lead us into error. Why? Because He's the Spirit of truth, and He can only speak the truth. So, an individual who says that the Spirit of God led them to do something which is manifestly contrary to the Word of God is lying. The Spirit of God can't do that. And yet, you'll find individuals talking about how the Spirit of God led them into an immoral lifestyle, led them into a homosexual relationship, revealed to them that they are gender swapped. The Spirit of God doesn't do that. That's some other spirit. It's another one of a different kind. It is not the same kind as Jesus Christ. You'll find individuals that say, I know the Word of God says, but the Spirit showed me. I talked to someone like that very recently. And I said, wait, wait, wait. This is what the Bible says. Oh, there are many translations. No, no, no. We're not talking about translations because no one would disagree that the underlying Greek text really means this. Well, that's just your opinion. No, that's what the Greek text says. But there are many translations. No, the word you want is interpretations. But the fact is, you cannot interpret according to your whim or convenience. You have to go consistent with what Scripture says. The Spirit of God is not going to lead anyone contrary to the Word of God. Because who gave us the Word of God? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not of two minds. He didn't write something through the hand of Paul that later he would change his mind about because he is the spirit of truth. Therefore, he cannot work against truth. To define truth, Scripture is very clear. John 17, verse 17, the high priestly prayer of Jesus Christ, when he says, sanctify them, make them holy through your truth. What is truth? Your word is truth. It is the Word of God that establishes truth. Not my perceptions, not my opinions, not someone else's perceptions or opinions. So false doctrine can never be sanctified by an appeal to the Holy Spirit. That is not a Holy Spirit. It is an unholy spirit that teaches doctrines or practices that are contrary to the revealed will and word of God. There is also a tendency of some individuals to say, well, you know, we can learn a lot from going to the New Age and occult groups because they have truths that aren't revealed in the Bible that we ought that, that are really God's truth. All truth is God's truth. Beware when someone says that. It's usually a pretext to introduce error. All truth is God's truth but define truth biblically. If you don't, you're going to be in for a rude awakening one day when you run up against the judgment of God. So get back to the Word of God. Let the Spirit of God direct you according to the Word of God. And if you're directed in any other sense, it's not the Holy Spirit. It's some other spirit. John 14, verse 17 the second half of the verse tells us that you know Him, for He dwells with you and shall be in you. He dwells with you and shall be in you. Now, that was a promise to the disciples. That has already happened. He's already indwelling every believer that is a true believer in Jesus Christ. So, He will dwell with believers forever is what this text says. 
In other words, we're to contrast this from the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Do you remember what was going on in the Old Testament? The Holy Spirit seems to have come and gone in relationship to different individuals' lives. For instance, let me just take one rather sad, tragic example, and that would be Saul, who became the first king of Israel. 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 10 says that the Spirit of God came upon him and he prophesied with the prophets to the point that people said, is Saul also one of the prophets? But by the time we get to 1 Samuel chapter 19, it says the Spirit of God had departed from him and an evil spirit had come upon him. It's nice to know that that's not that how the Spirit works today. Because this says that the Spirit of God will dwell in us forever. In other words, no believer will ever be abandoned by the Holy Spirit. Put this way, none of us will ever have to pray as David did in Psalm 51 verse 11, take not your Holy Spirit from me. It's not a prayer we need to pray because that doesn't happen if we're a true child of God. The Old Testament was a different time frame. Things worked differently. Why? There's no reason to speculate as to why. Scripture doesn't give us the why. We could talk about the cross, and certainly that plays a big role in it. But the point of the matter is that God's Word simply describes that there is a difference. In fact, Romans 8 verse 9, in relationship to having the Spirit or not having the Spirit, says that to be without the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God, is to not belong to Jesus. That sounds pretty dire. So much for those who are praying for the Spirit to come upon them. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, He's already done that. And He dwells within us. And that is what verse 17 says, He dwells within the believer. Talking about an ongoing, continual presence of the Spirit within our lives. In fact, Galatians 4 verse 6 says that God has sent His Spirit into our hearts, and by that Spirit we call out, Abba, Father. It's talking about that intimate relationship that we have that allows us to go directly to the throne of grace and cry out for mercy and help in time of need. So rather than, as I referred to earlier, uh, talking about asking Jesus into our heart, Scripture talks about our believing into Jesus, becoming part of His family, and then the Spirit moving into our lives. That's, you'll find, a consistent reflection of what the New Testament teaches in this regard. So the Holy Spirit is what we could call a continuation of the presence of Christ. And in fact, verse 18 refers to just that, where Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. He's talking about, I'm going to pray the Father, He will send this comforter. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. How is Jesus promising to come to them? By sending His Holy Spirit, by sending the Spirit of God. So it's a continuation of Christ's presence, another of the same kind. It's for all true children of God, everyone who is born of God, who is a child of God, has the presence of the Spirit within him or her. Otherwise, we would be as these orphans that Jesus describes, and that's not God's purpose. He doesn't birth people into his family and then just leave them on their own. He doesn't leave us as orphans. He places us in his family and places his Holy Spirit within us to give us the understanding we need, to give us teaching from the Word of God. And notice also here that he, the Holy Spirit is sent from the Father and in Jesus' name or on the basis of His authority in representation of Jesus. So having the Holy Spirit is to all intents and purposes, like having Jesus with us at all points and times because He is His representative. John 14, verse 26, describes Him as the Holy Spirit. This helper, this comforter, is the Holy Spirit. Now, keep that in mind. We're so used to calling Him the Holy Spirit that we don't even think twice about it. 
But we're supposed to understand that what this means is that he is totally set apart from sin. We are frequently bombarded with advertisements or statements about zero tolerance for this, that, or the other, which usually means that there's a certain tolerance and then you get to the point and then just, <laughs> they go crazy. But when we're talking about the Holy Spirit, we're talking about God Himself, there is a zero tolerance for sin. He is absolutely holy as we will not be until we are glorified. But also there is within this concept of holiness, the idea of being set apart from evil, but also being set apart or dedicated to godliness, which makes sense. He's God. But that is important when we're talking about God. But holiness is something that makes God completely different from anyone or anything you and I will ever know. So let me put it this way. He is distinct in character as God. Distinct in character. Someone has defined holiness as holy other. This is kind of getting to the idea that's expressed in one of the Psalms where God criticized the people of Israel because they thought He was just like they were. That's a pretty low standard for God, isn't it? But that's exactly what Romans 1 says, that when people reject the true God, they end up by making a God in their own image, making a God that is like they are. And that's very popular today. That's basically what you find in the seeker-sensitive movement. It's basically what you find, in other words, in the, in the megachurch movement. The idea of making God on your level. Well, God isn't on my level and He's not on your level, except by condescension. There is a complete separateness in the character of God and in the character of the Holy Spirit relating to that truth that we saw earlier, relating to how He responds to circumstances in life on the basis of truth. John 14, 26 also says that He would teach us all things, everything that we need to know. He instructs us as believers. How does He do that? How does the Holy Spirit teach us all things? Again, it's principally through His Word. The Word that He inspired, that He gave to individuals to write down, and He has preserved and brought to us in translated form. That's how the Spirit is going to communicate to us primarily. Is He capable of communicating in other ways? Sure. Because He's God, He, can, he has a lot of uh, options. And yet it is the Bible through which he communicates overwhelmingly. We've already mentioned this, but again, just to make it very clear, he will never lead us in any way contrary to the Word of God. Anyone who comes to us with that idea is to be rejected, Scripture says very clearly, even if they work miracles. If they don't speak consistent with the Word of God, then we're to consider them to be a false prophet. The Holy Spirit will never do that. Yet there are a lot of individuals talking about God told them and the Holy Spirit told me. What do you call that when individuals say that God told them something that's contrary to Scripture or the Holy Spirit told them to do something or teach something contrary to Scripture? You call that using the Lord's name in vain. You're setting him up as the, the authority, the source of this truth when he's not. And we need to be aware of that. And we need to know the Word of God well enough so that that can't happen to us without our realizing it's going on. But the Holy Spirit then teaches us everything we need for life and godliness. And this is a partial quote from 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, which talks about having before us in the Word of God everything that we need for life and godliness. And of course, that is by the Spirit's work and ministry in us. Back to John 14, 26. He will bring all things to your remembrance, all that I have said to you. This is what Christ tells His disciples. 
And so the Holy Spirit, another part of his ministry, is bring to our minds the words of Jesus Christ. That started out through the apostles. Remember that Matthew was not writing in a notebook every time Jesus preached. I don't see him there in the Sermon on the Mount writing copious notes so that he could write a gospel later on. I don't think it was even in his mind at that time. Or John, when he was listening to Christ there in the upper room, I don't think that he necessarily had his iPad out and jotting down everything that was being said. But at the right time, the Spirit of God reminds them of what they heard, and they're writing it down for us, and here we have the Word of God. But it doesn't stop there, because the Spirit also teaches us the words of Christ, teaches us what Christ is meaning when certain things are said. I'm sure you have had the experience of someone telling you that there are a lot of contradictions in the Bible. I always like to have the next statement be, well, show me one. Since there are a lot of them, show me one. Well, I I don't really know any, but, you know, it's just there are a lot of them. Don't make a statement unless you can back it up. Uh, But if someone brings something out, what do we usually find is the case? It's something that is easily explainable. It isn't a contradiction at all. How do we get to understand those things? I believe it's the ministry of the Holy Spirit teaching us regarding the words of Jesus Christ. He teaches us so that we can obey and be comforted by the words that Jesus Christ has given us. It's an important concept, isn't it? Remember the Great Commission. We're to make disciples and teach those disciples about what Christ has said so that they can keep these commandments. The Holy Spirit aids in that as He seals that truth to people's minds and hearts and makes the command something that we feel obligated to do. The Spirit also provides fellowship with the Son of God, Jesus Christ. It is only through the Holy Spirit that we have fellowship with Christ, that we have a relationship with Him. And that's part of him bringing the words of Christ to our minds. John 15, verse 26 then says, When the Helper, the Comforter, comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. This is another thing that's related to what we just looked at, but he bears witness concerning Jesus Christ concerning his identity, concerning his trustworthiness. And in relationship to this, our verse there in John 15, verse 26, reminds us that that is because just as Jesus Christ proceeds from the Father, so the Spirit proceeds from the Father. You remember that one of the earliest verses from John chapter 14 that we looked at, that Jesus says, I will pray the Father and he will send the Comforter the same source of the Spirit and the Son, both being divine, all three being divine in their person. But when the Spirit comes then, Jesus said he would speak about Christ. That's an interesting and a telltale mark for individuals who claim that they are more biblical in their doctrine of the Holy Spirit than you or I could ever hope to be. You see, because they're taking something completely away from Scripture and substituting their own ideas, the Holy Spirit always promotes Jesus Christ. That's what He has to talk about. He is not talking about Himself. So people that focus on the Holy Spirit, yes, He's just as much God as Jesus Christ or God the Father, and yet the purpose of the Holy Spirit is the promotion of Jesus Christ. So he assures us of the truth of Jesus' words as we read Scripture. His ministry within us helps us to understand those truths. The Holy Spirit is never self-promoting. I think it's 
something we need to be careful of, that, you know, having an overwhelming emphasis on the Holy Spirit. I think it's also important to remember not to forget the Holy Spirit. I think both sides are important. There has to be balance there. But the Holy Spirit, when we preach about the Holy Spirit, when we teach about the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ has to be all throughout that because that's what the Holy Spirit speaks about. That's His choice of conversation, you could say. John chapter 16 We're given a little bit more of the inner workings of how the Spirit relates in our lives. Verse 7 is where we'll start, where Scripture says, Nevertheless, Jesus speaking, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. He's talking about His death, His ascension to heaven after His resurrection. He says, If I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send Him to you. And when He comes, He will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in me concerning righteousness because I go to my father and you will not see me longer you will see me no longer concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged here we find the ministry of the holy spirit in bringing conviction he brings conviction he convinces people and three subject matters, uh, are matters of, uh, of, of conviction, are brought up in these verses. The first of which is sin. And in particular, the Holy Spirit convicts people of the sin of not believing in Christ. It may be troubling to you how many people do not truly believe in Christ. I'm not talking about the historical person of Jesus, but rather the biblical teaching regarding Jesus Christ. It is the Holy Spirit that has to convict the heart regarding the person of Jesus Christ. And he says, they believe not on me, giving us the idea that it is unbelief of this nature which condemns souls to hell. A lack of acceptance, a a deliberate rejection of what Jesus Christ taught and of who Jesus Christ is. It is the Holy Spirit's work, because none of us has ever met Jesus Christ personally. We've never talked to Him personally. If you think you have, talk to me afterward. I'll straighten you out. But the fact of the matter is that the Spirit of God is our connection to the Son of God. He convinces us that we should believe in Christ. John 14, verse 1, Jesus speaking to the disciples in the upper room says, Believe in God, believe also in me. Just as they believed in God in the sense of His unique being, His deity, that there is a God in heaven, they were also required to believe in the Son of God, in Jesus Christ. It is the Spirit, remember what Jesus said to Peter after Peter makes that initial confession about who Jesus Christ is, He is the Son of the living God and Jesus says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And how does the Father do that? He does that through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. As the Spirit convicts our hearts regarding who Jesus Christ is. Scripture makes it very clear that Jesus is the only one who is designed by the Father to be our Savior. It's not the Holy Spirit's role to save us in that sense, because the Holy Spirit did not die on a cross for us, nor was He resurrected from the grave. It is Jesus Christ's work of atonement that saves. But it's the Holy Spirit that convinces us that that's even legitimate, that it's real. It's the Holy Spirit who brings us to understand our need of Jesus Christ. So we're dependent upon the Spirit to show us the Savior. Verse 10 of John chapter 16 talks about the Spirit's role in convicting us regarding righteousness in the absence of Christ. Why do I say in the absence of Christ? Because it says concerning righteousness, because I go to my Father and you will see me no longer. Jesus was here for a limited time. During the time that Jesus was here on earth, 
Think about his relationship to righteousness. He lived an absolutely perfect life. He fulfilled all righteousness in every relationship. His relationship to God, which is the first and foremost, but also in his relationship to other people, his relationship to his parents. He fulfilled all righteousness. It's not easy to do, is it? Parents are difficult because we're sinful. And our kids are difficult because they're sinful. And people we work with, people we go to school with or whatever, people are difficult because people are sinful. But here's Jesus Christ fulfilling all righteousness. And just think about Him walking through life and the contacts He had throughout His life and how He rebuked unrighteousness in other people just simply by being there. Because He's perfect. But He didn't stop with just being there. He also taught things that unmasked the hypocrisy which many people were living with And you see, the reason hypocrites are what hypocrites are is because they don't want you knowing about what they really are. So they put on a show. They want you to believe that. Jesus is unmasking the hypocrites. He's rebuking unrighteousness. He's talking about a righteousness which exceeds that of all of the so-called righteous people. But when Jesus is gone, who's to carry on that work? That work of rebuking unrighteousness and portraying righteousness, it's the Spirit that does that. The Spirit carries on this work today in mankind. It is the Spirit of God who is the vicar of Christ on the earth. Do you recognize that phrase? That's what the Pope pretends to be, but can never be because the job's filled. The Holy Spirit is the vicar, the representative, the official representative of Christ on earth. So he stands in Christ's stead in everything that relates to us. He reveals righteousness to us. His work of convicting over sin is part of that. But he also holds up the standard of true righteousness found in the Word of God. And he shows us that we don't measure up. And when we see that, we have two options. One option is to look into the perfect law of liberty and be changed thereby. And the other is to gaze into the perfect law of liberty and to go on our merry way in rebellion to true righteousness. The Spirit convicts us and shows us our need of righteousness. Scripture tells us that even for believers, however, Jesus Christ is our only righteousness. He has become to us righteousness. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. He is our righteousness. We have no other plea before God. He convicts us of sin, convicts of righteousness, but He also convicts concerning judgment to come. And the statement that is made there in verse 11 is, He convicts concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Now, some people have thought that this refers to Jesus Christ. Because the world was judging Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is going to convict them of having judged Jesus Christ. I don't believe that's what it's meaning. I think it's talking about the prince of this world in a sense that refers to Satan himself. What is the Holy Spirit's role? It's to show us that no one escapes God's judgment, starting with Satan. It might look like Satan's getting away. We look at it and say, look, how many thousands of years is God going to put up with this? Don't know. But Satan will be judged. He has not escaped God's notice. He is not outside the realm of God's power. In fact, no one can escape God's judgment. If if Satan himself can't escape, what hope do you and I have of escaping? And so from the greatest of all offenders being judged comes the certainty that every lesser offender will also be judged, so you and I had best prepare. But what happens? The book of Ecclesiastes says that because judgment is delayed, 
evildoers grow bold. It's why we have such a problem in our society. People say the death penalty doesn't work as a deterrent to murder. Well, of course not when you wait until everyone is dead that remembers the crime. And then you execute the criminal. Why? Well, this is supposed to be some measure of justice and mercy. But scripture says that the swift execution of this sentence brings a sense of justice. Well, God in His mercy has decided to delay judgment. And we can be thankful for that, frankly. What if God chose to judge us the first time we had a blasphemous thought enter our minds? How many of us would still be here? No one. <laughs> our many, many times removed great-grandparents great would have ended that hope for us. But in each of us, there is a need for the mercy of God. And yet, sometimes the mercy of God leads us to boldness in sinning against God, doesn't it? No judgment has come. Sowing and reaping principle must have gone out of date. It's not going to affect me, but the Word of God says, no, we're not to entertain such thoughts because God will not be mocked. What we sow, we will reap. Judgment may be delayed, but it will come. That's what Christ teaches us. That's what the Holy Spirit assures us of, that judgment is coming, and we ought to prepare for it. Verse 13 of John chapter 16 says, When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth, for He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will declare it to you. He will declare to you the things that are to come. So He guides us into all truth. We talked about the Spirit of truth earlier. It's to be expected that the Spirit of truth guides us in truth. First of all, we need to understand who we are, though. How do we relate to truth? The Scripture tells us very clearly that each of us is opposed to truth. We reject truth. That's our natural position. Anyone we talk to that rejects truth, understand that that is the unenlightened position. That is outside the work of the Holy Spirit. It is obvious evidence that the Spirit's work of directing in truth is still needed. The Holy Spirit then comes along and teaches us truth as we are willing. You can sin against grace. You can sin against the Spirit's work. We talked recently about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit and how that leaves a person without any hope at all. But the Spirit of truth will teach us if we're willing to listen. As we mentioned earlier, He does this through the Word of God. John 17, verse 17, God's Word is the standard for truth. But there's something else that comes out in verse 13. Whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. This is in particular the idea of prophecy, things which are to come to accomplish that, to teach us these truths. Remember when what John, the time frame John, John is writing from, there's still more truth to be revealed. The Holy Spirit has given us throughout the ages prophets and apostles. And I leave it there, prophets and apostles, because when the apostolic age had ceased, with the death of the last personally handpicked, apostle, we no longer have the prophets and apostles as we have in Scripture. These individuals gave us the Word of God and gave us as well prophecies regarding the future. The Spirit then aids us in the interpretation of the Word, and I could illustrate to you historically how the Holy Spirit has given gradual insight into some of these things to come so that there is a better understanding today in some areas of doctrine than there was hundreds of years ago. 
This has been a step-by-step development that the Spirit has worked starting in really the second century, one century removed from Jesus Christ, when they're haggling over and coming to understand biblically the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And what they're wrestling with is the dual natures of Jesus Christ. He is God and he is man. And that gets fleshed out. That gets treated in exhaustively, you could say. And then you come through gradual periods and time frames where the people of God are learning more about the Word of God in particular ways. And prophecy honestly seems to be the last of the scheduled events or the instructional teachings. And the Holy Spirit continues to teach us if we're willing to learn from what Scripture already says. We're not talking about new verses of Scripture, but allowing us to have insight into the Word as well as insight into the events of our world so that we can put them together. I'm reminded of what Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, verse 3, when He was chiding the people of His day, and He said, "'You know how to discern the weather from the skies.'" But don't you know how to discern the signs of the times? And he's referring to the need to understand what Scripture says and how that applies to life. That needs to be something that we're instructed in continually from the Holy Spirit. Scripture also says in verses 14 and 15 of John 16, these words, He, the Holy Spirit, will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and will declare it to you. The Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus Christ. He exalts Jesus Christ, not himself. It's all about Jesus Christ. That is the subject matter the Spirit has. And in relation to that, He leads us to fully trust in Jesus Christ. We think when we come to know Jesus Christ in salvation that we fully trust Jesus Christ. And maybe you can chuckle with that because you understand how much you've learned if you've known the Lord any length of time, how much more you learn all the time regarding Jesus Christ going back over the same scriptures that were given decades, even millennia ago. And we understand more and more. Why is that? Why is it that we pick up the Word of God, we should do so on a daily basis, and pour over those words? And how is it that something new comes out of that? We have the Spirit of God resident within us. That's His role. He glorifies Christ by making a lot of Jesus Christ. That should be our emphasis as well. It's interesting to note that the doctrine of the Holy Spirit is one of those doctrines that is clouded with many, many kinds of error. And yet the Word of God is fairly clear about what the Spirit does and how the Spirit does it. It's our responsibility to understand what the Word of God says Do you realize that even the miracle at Pentecost was an anomaly? It's not how God usually works. It's not how God's Spirit usually works. But what we have in these words from Jesus Christ, from John chapters 14, 15, and 16, is clear evidence of teaching on the part of Jesus Christ that there would come a time of normative experience. The disciples weren't in that when Jesus was saying these words. They weren't yet in that normative time frame when Acts chapter 2 occurred, or even most of the events of the book of Acts. But we would come to a time when the people of God would understand that we don't depend upon the Holy Spirit doing miracles every day, tangible things, whether healings or illuminations or prophecies, in order to be guided by the Holy Spirit. We have the Word of God. We have the wisdom of God in that book, and it is through knowing what Jesus says about the Spirit, not only here in this passage, but also throughout the epistles, that we can understand what the truth is and allow that truth 
to impact our lives, to make our lives productive, to give us blessing by knowing the result of the Spirit working in our lives. May each of us accept the challenge of understanding what the Word of God says and not being as children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine that comes down the pike. Let's pray. Father, use your Word to instruct us. We know our need. We have a grave need of truth and of listening to that truth. We thank you for your Spirit whom you have given to guard us and to guide us. May we allow the Spirit to communicate to us through your Word. Allow our minds to be shaped, to be molded, so that what we see around us can always be interpreted on the basis of what your Word has already said. Lord, prevent any here from following the errors of this world, the unbelief of the world, the invented doctrines of the world, but rather to come to full and complete faith in what is revealed in your word, that we might please you, that we might obey you and be your servants here in this life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Ray, would you come please?